What's up, Life Point Church? How you guys doing today? Come on, are you glad you came to church on a Sunday? Man, what a great day. I want to say welcome to all of you. It is fall time in Tennessee, I think for real this time, everybody. It's great weather day, and uh, thank you for making your way to church, and um, thank you for being a part of our service. If this is your very first time, we want to once again welcome all of our first time guests. Come on, Life Point, say what's up, everybody. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Also, everybody joining us online and at our Austin P. State University campus, we love you guys and so thankful for you. If you're new to our church, take a moment and scan that QR code. It should be on the seat back in front of you in this room and also available digitally for you guys at Austin P. But just connect with us. Please let us know you are here. We promise not to harass you. We just want to follow up with some simple next steps for you. As I always do, I want to say thanks for being a generous church. I say it every week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Last week, I preached the whole message. What does the Bible say about generosity and tithing and giving and stewardship. And uh, man, if you missed that message, please go back and grab it. The illustration at the end, I've gotten more feedback on that illustration with the the two tables and what what our portion is to God and what we can do together. And so thank you for being a church that provides for for God's house through tithes and offerings. And so whether you give online or in the mail through one of our lobby boxes, or if you uh, just throw a bag of nickels from a helicopter when you're flying over, however you wanna do it, it doesn't really, it's up to you, please don't do that. Um, That would actually be hilarious. A lot of you pilots fly yeah, I feel like LifePoint is on your route for practicing. And so some of y'all just need to text us ahead of time and we'll come out on the soccer field. We'll bring you coffee. Love to kick it with you for a few minutes. But anyway, um, hey, we are committed. We, we committed this years ago. Not only do we practice tithing individually, but as a church, we give 10% of the income of this church away. And we partner with missionaries and church planners and nonprofits and organizations that are making a difference for Jesus. Can I hear an amen, everybody? And so there's a couple partners that I wanted to highlight for you today, especially because last month is a big month for us. Uh, We believe in church planting. In fact, statistically, starting new churches is one of the greatest ways to reach people far from God, reaching people that don't know Jesus. And we've decided at LifePoint, we want every day to, every Sunday to feel like an opportunity for somebody who doesn't know Christ to come and meet the Lord. But church planting statistically is one of the ways to, to do that, to reach people who are far from God. And every fall, there's a church planting season, like in the, in the beginning of the year, and then in the fall, September, October is a big time. And we partner with two of the largest church planting organizations in the country. One is the ARC, the Association of Related Churches, and their executive director, Dino Rizzo, is one of our overseers. He preaches here every year, and we know the ARC very well. The other is a, a, an organization called the Church Multiplication Network, which I'm a part of because of my denominational ties and connection with the AG. And uh, they, are, they are the two like, largest getting it done church plants. The, art, the, the, the Church Multiplication Network this year, oh, so we, we, we give to them monthly. Your generosity allows us to give to them every single month. And uh, this year we've helped plant with Church Multiplication Network 200 new churches around the country. And we celebrate that. That's great news, everybody. And with the ARC, with the Association of Related Churches, we've planted 61 brand new churches. And I got some stats for you that I think are just exciting. Out of 61 new churches, these are people that didn't have a church or had been out of church for a long time, 14,043 people were at their launch Sundays this year. And out of those 549 people on launch Sunday alone this year of 61 churches have raised their hand and said yes to following Jesus. You're being a part of that by your generosity. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Every time you give, we get to celebrate that we are helping plant churches. So I just want you to know the things that you're doing that are beyond your, your personal touch, but through your generosity, we're planting churches, we're feeding the hungry, we're helping resource families, we're helping marriages come back together, we're restoring foster kids to their parents. I mean, we're doing all kinds of things through your generosity. Of course, our, partner with, our partnership with Convoy of Hope is no secret around here. We love what they do for feeding and water projects and women's empowerment around the world, but their, their primary strength in the U.S. is in disaster relief. And Convoy of Hope was waiting on Hurricane Ian before it landed with multiple uh, vehicles and ready to get on the ground and get involved. And they always do their work through local churches. Well, we not only do two big offerings a year with Convoy, but we also give monthly. As you give, we give 10% of the income away and Convoy of Hope is one of our partners. And they wanted to send a thank you to LifePoint specifically for our partnership with them. Uh, they send it by video because of what they're doing because of Hurricane Ian. Check this out. Hello from Fort Myers, Florida, which took a direct hit from Hurricane Ian. Convoy of Hope is on the ground here. It's an area devastated by the storm. There are homes flooded, trees and power lines down everywhere. The damage is immense. During this season of hopelessness, 
Convoy of Hope is delivering hope through life-sustaining essentials, showing God's love through kindness. I just want to say thank you to Life Point Church for your prayers for the people of Florida and for our Convoy of Hope team. Thank you for your generosity that empowers us to show God's love in a tangible way to people who are hurting. We couldn't do this without you. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're honored. What a privilege to serve. God, what a privilege to give and to serve. And now we turn our prayers, not only to hear a good word from you, but Lord, we pray for people in Florida who are devastated by this storm. Lord, we know that you are the author of peace. You're the prince of peace. You're the God who provides. You will make a way where there seems not to be a way. God, we pray that you would do all the things that you do. And thank you, Lord, that you use the church. You use organizations like Convoy of Hope. And Lord, we pray that hope would come alive in Florida, that God's lives would be restored back to normal, back to a new normal. And God, that you would get all the glory. Let the church come alive in Florida to see people changed and touched for the gospel in Jesus' name. God, we are honored to be a part of what you're doing in, in Christ's name, amen. Today we are back in the book of Acts and I wanna encourage you to turn with me to Acts chapter 19. I, I love, my preference of preaching is to go verse by verse through books of the Bible. So if you don't know that, if you're new to our church, we like preaching the word and uh, in particular, we take long journeys through big books of the Bible. So we, uh, in, on Easter of 2021, we started a series in the book of Acts. And so today we are in Acts chapter 19 and I titled the message, The Gospel Changes People For Real. I've never been good at titling sermons, so just give me some slack, will you? I'm better at content of sermons than titles, but the gospel changes people for real, so stay focused on that. And I wanna, I wanna ask you on the front end of this message, would you uh, consider yourself as one of the characters in the text today? And I'm gonna give you permission to be the Apostle Paul, like to, to ask God, Lord, give me the passion and the mantle and the energy that the Apostle Paul has in Acts chapter 19. So I want you to be led by him as a model today. While you're turning there, Acts chapter 19, let me ask you just a question. Have you ever had a time where something was so exciting for you, you just couldn't help tell other people about it? Anybody like a good evangelist about random stuff? No one's listening, great. So. Like last week, how all of us Tennessee fans were shaming them swamp-headed Florida Gators, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I never talk about football games. I don't remember snaps, plays, players. I don't remember none of that. When the game's over, my brain has moved on. But last week, oh man, I was talking some smack, smack, smack to all my Florida friends. They were smacking Gator chomps and I was just dogging them because I was so excited that Tennessee finally pulled out a W. Come on, Jesus, the Lord is with his volunteers. A few months ago, I got the same kind of dorkiness about Top Gun Maverick. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like, and listen, if you weren't born before 1995, just hush for a minute. But all the rest of us remember as kids watching little Tom Cruise in Top Gun. And we were so excited and we all wanted to be fighter pilots. You remember that? And we were all just like chewing gum like Val Kilmer, <laughs> you know, just, so, it's just me, okay? But I just remember being, and when I saw the new one, I was thinking, man, sequels are not always as good as the first one. I left that theater texting people going, you've got to get to go see this movie. I'm like, Stephanie, let's go again, buy another ticket. You know, I love that movie. I don't ever promote Tom Cruise movies. But this movie, I was an evangelist for. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, there's just something about getting excited about something and telling other people you're excited. It could be the dumbest stuff. It could be things that don't matter. Maybe you got a new weed eater this fall and you're just, you can't wait to tell people. But we all have things that get us spun up, right? As a church, we love to talk about small groups and baptisms. Come on, Jesus, let's get baptized today. We love the dream team. We love missions and giving generously. We love to talk about what excites us and changes our lives. Maybe for you, you're excited about the stage of your kids. My oldest daughter is at homecoming this weekend. Oh man, she's so beautiful and I hate boys. <laughs> it's a joke, all you teenage boys chill out, I'm just kidding. I got friends that are real good shots though, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you get excited about something your company does that's like changing families and, or some, something you learned in school in the classroom at Austin P. Maybe some piece of technology that has made your life easier, some new app. You just can't wait to show off what's going on. Well, when's the last time that we got so excited about this gospel 
that we believed in. Now, look, I'm going to get all my high horse here today. I'm telling you, when's the last time we got so excited about our faith that we couldn't help but tell people about Jesus Christ, that we believe he's the only way to know God and find freedom? What if we got so excited about our faith in Christ as we did about football victories and new movies with Tom Cruise? I'm convinced that we actually have the most powerful story to share with anybody. We've got the best news the world has ever needed. And I believe that faith in Christ is the best thing that we could possibly share with the world. And yet, I'm not so sure that we stay excited about the gospel anymore. I think sometimes I'm convicted in my own life that that what is changing heaven feels normal to me now. I mean, we baptized 120 people two weeks ago. Do you know the average? And we golf clap, like I appreciate that, but that should be like, that's revival. Do you understand contextually, listen to me. The average size of churches in the country is under 80. And we baptized 50% more than that in one two hour stint. That is incredible, that is like amazing. And we like, People raise their hands to give their lives to Jesus and families are being restored and kids are coming back to their families and parents and marriages are being fixed. Like we got the best news, but I think like sometimes I'm convicted that this is just my job. Of course that stuff happens. I do this all the time. And I'm convicted for us that I think, you know, we, we evangelize the world about things that are so for right now, our politics, our preferences, the the newest story of what's happening with our kids. I mean, how, how, how many things do you shout out on social media that you're super excited about? And I think it's great. But what if we got that excited about this gospel that actually transforms people and changes people forever? Like, do I have the same, when I read the book of Acts and as I'm studying to prep for sermons and I'm, I'm reading through, I see how they lived. I see what they did. And I'm asking myself, Mike, am I willing to live the way they did? Am I willing to go for it the way? This wasn't just the ministers versus the others. It was all of them. Like there was passion. Do I have the same passion as a preacher, the same drive to live disciplined and godly and as a Christian? Do I have the same willingness to be used by God like they do? Am I willing to go to jail? Am I willing to be boiled in oil? Am I willing to be beaten within an inch of my life? Do we value church attendance like they did? The book of Acts is actually called the the Acts of the Apostles. The idea, Pastor Randy was talking to us this week, the Acts of the Apostles, the name of the book is really the the, the story of what they did. It's the behaviors of the apostles. It's the, the attitudes of the apostles. They went to church faithfully. They went six and seven times a week. They preached without pulling back. They, they confronted wickedness. They were willing to do whatever it took for this message to go forward. But do we? Do we walk in the same power of God? We're gonna see in next week's text that Paul's handkerchiefs had enough anointing left on them. I mean, that's a prayer life. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know about you, but I ain't never thrown a blanket on somebody and it changed their lives. The apostle Paul's handkerchiefs were healing people. That's how powerful God was using him. And I'm not saying any of this to shame us. I'm saying this to push us and to challenge us Is the gospel so central to my life as it was to theirs? I remember when I was a new Christian, I was 17, my senior year of high school, and and I was known, you know, around my school. I was voted class clown my senior year. Can you believe that? That's insulting. They elected me to be our class speaker at graduation. I was a a known guy in my school, and and, um, then I became a Christ follower, and I became really known for that. I mean, I couldn't wait to tell people about what I learned in youth group, what they were talking about at church. I couldn't wait. And I was like judgy friend of everybody, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, if you don't come, you're going to hell. I'm telling you, you know, like I was that guy. So I was obnoxious in my zeal. I didn't know anything, but man, I was passionate. I had friends, they were like, bro, we get it. My own family kind of got tired of it, to be honest with you. But if, do we lose that? Because we, do it, is it normal to grow out of that? Is it? okay to kind of graduate from passion. But I read the book of Acts and I'm like, man, these dudes, man, amazing. So we're coming out of what does the Bible say and we're going back into what does the Bible show in the book of Acts and the Acts of the Apostles. And as we transition back to Acts 19, we're picking up with the Apostle Paul 
Now he's coming into Ephesus, which is a city, and we wrote a letter, he wrote a letter to the Ephesian church called Ephesians, but he's coming to bring pastoral leadership. And he came there after a guy named Apollos. Now, six weeks ago, uh, we were in the book of Acts, seven weeks ago, and I preached the beginning of Acts 18, and Pastor Wayne preached the end of Acts 18, and we were introduced to this guy named Apollos, a really passionate orator. He was a great preacher. He was passionate for God and passionate for preaching and building disciples, but he just wasn't 100% accurate on his theology. How many of us love God but don't know everything about him yet? Uh, that's all of you, please say amen. Yes, okay, good. So in Acts 18, we see this couple named Priscilla and Aquila pull, Paul, pull Apollos aside to teach him more accurately and completely the rest of the gospel. So, so he could match his, pia, his passion to his theology, right? Because Apollos had a ton of passion. He just didn't really know all of what he was talking about. Well, then Apollos has been benched for a little bit and the apostle Paul comes on the scene and that's where we pick up and we're gonna see this passion and this life transformation. And the first thing that we notice in this text is that if we're gonna have passion and see the gospel change lives, then clarity in Christ is actually really important. How many of you know clarity is kindness? I mean, it's kind to be clear. Be clear with your spouse. Be clear with your kids. Be clear with your boss. Be clear with your employees' expectations. Clarity is kind. And clarity in Christ is incredibly important. So watch what happens. Apollos has been benched. Priscilla and Aquila are discipling him. And then it, to, it shows us in verse 1, chapter 19, verse 1. So it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, so now he's been sat down. He was in Ephesus, but Priscilla and Aquila pulled him away. That's in the previous paragraph. Paul passed through the inland country, this is Asia Minor is what they would have called this at the time, and he came to Ephesus. Ephesus is a major trade city. It's a bustling city. It's got a lot of Greek history and influence, but this church is starting out. And, and it says there he found some disciples. If, since you brought a Bible, turn there and just underline that because that's a really uh, troubling little statement and we wrestled through that as a team this week. He found some disciples. And he said to them, the disciples, watch his question. This is great pastoring. He goes, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this is a pretty normal question, I think, for Paul as a Christian leader. He's just saying, like, are you guys living spirit-led lives? Does the Holy Spirit directing? Did you receive the teaching on the Holy Spirit when you believed in Jesus? And they said, no, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Now, alarm bells are going off for the Apostle Paul. I don't know if y'all know this, but this dude was tight with the Holy Ghost. And I love his response. He doesn't just cram stuff down their throats, start chucking the Bible at them and go, what, you heretic, you're going to hell. He asks them probing questions. He says, so then into what were you baptized? Can I just tell all of you, let me just empower you with something. If people don't know what you know, don't choke them with it. Ask more questions. Like, this is good pastoring. This is good leadership. Hey, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? We didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. Well, then how were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized into John's baptism. Now, they quoted John the Baptist, y'all. This is like OG before Jesus theology. Before the gospel of Jesus, before the anointing and ministry of Jesus Christ was his older cousin named John. John was a wiry-haired, locust-eater weirdo in the, in the, in the desert that was proclaiming this lone voice, every one of y'all, Israelites, y'all need to repent from your sin. You're all a bunch of sinners and you all need to repent. And I'm gonna show you this ritual. I'm called, it's the first one that ever taught it. Baptism was John the baptizer. He goes, I'm gonna teach you this baptism ritual that's symbolic of you washing sin out of your life. And so I'm gonna dunk your butts in the water and the rest of you, I'm gonna dunk you in the water and you're gonna repent from living sinful, and then you're gonna wait for Jesus to come. He goes, how are you baptized? They said into John's baptism. So Paul does a little teaching, he's a good pastor. He goes, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Turn from your sin, be a good person. Don't do that crazy stuff anymore. But John also told them to believe in the one who was to come after him. In other words, John's saying, he says, John was like, I'm not the last guy y'all need to follow. Y'all need to believe in the one coming after John, and then Paul gives clarity, that is Jesus. Because John didn't say, believe in Jesus who's coming. He said, prepare, your, prepare the way for the Lord who is coming, and he never named him until Jesus came on the scene. But now Paul's giving clarity because these guys are baptized. They're some disciples of somebody, and they've been baptized like, don't live a bad life anymore. 
That's John's baptism, a, a, a baptism of forgiveness of sin and bad behavior. But Paul's giving clarity going, oh man, there's more to his story. You guys didn't know his story, the rest? You didn't know the, 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 the sequel? Yeah, 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 he told them to actually also believe on the one who was to come, and that's Jesus, which tells us a whole lot in this one little verse. Really, this is Luke's accounting of it, but probably what really happened was Paul goes, sit down. Let me tell you the rest of the story. Paul took an opportunity to ask questions, to gain clarity, to see where people were at on their journey, and then he told them the whole story of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is God himself who came to the earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died. This is the one John the Baptist was talking about, that we would put our faith and our hope in him and believe in the one, which for the New Testament to believe in is not to agree mentally, it's to lock arms with and lock your life into the one who was to come, and he's pointing it all to Jesus. Now just remember, Apollos was a great brother. He just wasn't very theologically tuned up right now. He was very passionate for God, and he was trying to set people towards God. So we understand that these 12, these disciples, there was 12 of them, they were disciples. Remember what it said in verse one? There Paul found some disciples. They were disciples of Apollos. They were probably like good people, but Priscilla and Aquila had benched Apollos, put them in a small group, said, hey, we need to teach you some stuff. By the way, all of you need a small group because none of you have 100% clear theology and all of you need some tweaking. Praise the Lord, even your boy, Pastor Mike. Come on, somebody. So Paul's in Ephesus and Apollos has gone to grow some. And he comes upon these disciples. And we're gonna see later there's 12 of them, 12 men in particular. The discussion is who were they disciples of? But we know that they're probably disciples of Apollos. Some people say, well, they're Christians. They were followers of Jesus, but they weren't yet. And we see that by the reaction of what happens here. They were disciples. Here's, here's what I see that, that. These guys were oriented towards God. Listen to me, guys. They were oriented towards God. They had a good heart. They wanted to learn. They probably were good people. They'd been baptized in John's baptism of water, which symbolized they wanted to leave an old life and do right and live right. But they hadn't heard clarity on the gospel yet. They hadn't heard of Jesus. They hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that doing good and living right was not enough to ensure salvation. I want everyone in the room to look at me right now. You being a good person is a false thing to pursue. You being a God-filled person is the gospel. You are never good enough. We will never behave enough to, to appease the wrath of God and to earn salvation. Only the goodness of Jesus offers us salvation. These people were good people, but they needed God on the inside of them. And so Paul brings clarity. He, he's trying to tell them doing good and living right. And just because you got baptized after John, this crazy prophet doesn't mean that you're good enough. So Paul brings clarity. He tells them Jesus died for their sins. They don't actually need to be baptized for their sins. Now they put their faith in Christ for their sins. And because Jesus died for them, now the Holy Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit, wants to come live on the inside of them. Here's the difference. Here's the exchange of the gospel. It's not about you being good enough. It's about God coming on the inside of you and making you good. That's the gospel. Because Jesus raised from the dead, then the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. That's why he asked that question. Have you guys received the Holy Spirit? Are you living spirit-filled, spirit-led lives? They go, we don't even know what you're talking about. Well, clearly they didn't know about Jesus because he talked about it many times in his gospel. And what Paul has to teach them now is, okay, let's go back from your time of repentance. I get it, you're oriented towards God, but Jesus is now your new orientation. And if you'll accept what he's done for you, the Holy Spirit will be God in you. Listen to me, guys. God does not make you God. He makes you good. There's a lot of religions that teach, man. He, I'm just, I'm a little God. No, you're not. You are not. That's heresy, period. You're never God. But you're good when God's in you. Does that make sense? So Paul is teaching this. He's bringing clarity. By the way, their reaction is bonkers. It's amazing. But Paul, listen, I think all of us have people in our lives who believe in God, who want to do good. They don't want to be a sinner or a bad person. They may even come to church or like give charitably or not cuss around you or whatever. They, they're oriented towards the Lord. But how many of you know knowing about God is not the same as knowing God? Being a fan of Jesus is not the same as being a follower of Jesus. Coming to the church on a weekend is not the same as coming to Christ every day of your life. So Paul took the time to bring clarity because clarity 
about Christ is kind. Your friends and your colleagues and your classmates and your coworkers need clarity. I wanna ask you to get as passionate and excited about giving clarity to people as you are about everything else that you get excited about. Your friends need clarity. Your family members need clarity about the gospel. You and I need clarity. This is why I say we need to be in small groups. This is why we need to be at church and be in the word and pray and understand that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. He offered salvation, he defeated sin, and the spirit of God wants to live on the inside of you. People need clarity about that. How many of y'all know good people that aren't saved? That's the missing dots for them. They have an orientation towards, I wanna do right. I wanna be right. I wanna even know God. And we have an opportunity to bring clarity about Jesus. So what if we got so excited about this good news that we couldn't tell, but tell people? Can I ask you to start with questions? Tell me what you believe about Jesus. Tell me where you're at with your walk with God. I, just walk into, church, into work this week and go, go to somebody and say, man, God's been so good to me. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you this week? <laughs> and let them stare at you. And let them do like they did to Paul. I don't know the Holy Spirit. Because I'm telling you guys, this is an epidemic in our world. This is an epidemic with church people. We don't know the Holy Spirit. We don't live by the Holy Spirit. Just go to work like that. Man, what's God speaking to you this week? Be weird about it. Just a, a little weird. Not a weirdo weird, but just a little. <laughs> and do it with people you're friends with. Oh, man, don't you know the Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of us? He's our teacher, our advocate, our peace giver, our friend. Oh, man, he's teaching me all kinds of stuff. Like just this week, I heard from my pastor. Just this week, I was reading in Galatians. Just this week, I read, and God said, most people don't know that's what God wants to do in them. So what if we grew so passionate to connect the dots for people on this message? Tell people the rest of the story, good people that need clarity about the gospel. Did you know almost 90% of our community does not attend church or follow Jesus? We have plenty of people to share this with. This is why we stay putting on services every weekend. This is why we want more campuses. Because we believe clarity in Christ is good for people. Can I hear an amen? amen. So then watch what happens. Man, they hear this. They're disciples. They're oriented towards God. They're seekers. And Paul brings clarity. God wrecks their lives. Man, I've said it for years. We want anybody to come to Life Point and let Jesus wreck their lives. I've had so many emails. I don't know about Jesus wrecking lives. That seems so negative. Back off. <laughs> what I mean is we want anybody to come and let Jesus wreck and upend and turn around and change their lives. Yes. Not destroy it, make it better. But for some of us, we need a little wreckage. Get some of them people out of our lives. Get some of them habits out of our lives. Get some of that bad theology out of our lives. Have a wreck on some of that craziness. But watch their reaction. Man, they don't get in the weeds on debating theology and syntax and semantics and what my mama said, and I didn't grow up that way. And well, what do you think about? Man, I love when I have to interview for my job every Sunday, y'all. Let me tell you something. I get in the lobby and some of y'all coming new, you know, you're like, well, pastor, what do you believe about? I already have this job, so I don't even, be, I ain't interviewing anymore. I'm already here. I believe the Bible's true and you need to read more of it. Like, that's what I believe. And I'm learning, I'm growing, I don't know everything. I just know Jesus saved me and we're just gonna do this together. I'm not interviewing with you. Is that, I'm projecting a lot right now. That's what that feels like. <laughs> Whew, pray for me. I just know God changes lives. My man, come on. Watch what happens next. On hearing this news, God wants to live in you. Jesus will change you. You don't have to behave right, you just believe right. You don't have to get your actions right. You get yourself close to Jesus. He tells them, connects the dots. And on hearing this, notice not watching him live a Christian life. Some of y'all need to move from like living witness to verbal witness. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name. They'd already been baptized. They had the wrong baptism. That was a before Jesus baptism and it's never necessary again. Now they're baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we're gonna pause on this for a minute for some of us theologically that get tripped up on systems. And when Paul laid hands on them, watch this, I love this. 
The Holy Spirit came upon them. That's the very thing he started talking to them about. Have y'all received the Holy Spirit when you believed in Jesus? They hadn't received, which means they hadn't believed in Jesus. So they heard the truth. They got clarity. So they believed in Jesus. They got baptized into the faith of Jesus. Paul lays hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them. And they started speaking in tongues and prophesying or preaching or talking about Jesus. And this is where we see there was 12 of them, 12 men in all. Okay, this text is awesome. I love this moment. This particular passage excites me for so many reasons. I wanna give you two views of this text. We're gonna go big picture and small picture, okay? Big picture and then close up. Here's the big picture, you ready? People want the truth. People need the truth. People want the gospel. People are oriented towards good. They wanna do good. There are some people that are just evil and wicked. We need to pray for them to have a heart turned around. But a lot of your friends, none of us hang out with scoundrels on purpose, right? Like most of our friends are nice and kind and like good to their parents. They're doing their best and they, they probably respect your faith and they want the truth and they want the gospel. And when you'll give clarity, when you'll say the truth, I believe with all my heart because God's in the mix, they will respond and they will go all in with Jesus. People will give their lives to Christ. This is why we support church planting. That's how 549 people got saved on launch Sundays at all these churches because God still changes people. And their immediate response when they heard truth and clarity was to make a decision to follow Jesus. Notice Paul didn't get in all the weeds about arguments or debates. Paul's the one that says, avoid meaningless controversy and stupid debates. Avoid that stuff. But man, Christians are so good at nuances and debates and meaningless stuff. He said, avoid all that stuff. Paul didn't get in the weeds. He told him the gospel. He made it clear. He told him about Jesus. He had passion in his voice. And then he told him the Holy Spirit of God wants to live on the inside of you and change your life. Can I just encourage you guys with something? Listen to me. You don't have to overcomplicate this. God made it as simple as possible. Humans are sinners. God will fix that. He himself came to give his life to pay for our sin and to change sinners to sons and daughters. And the spirit of God now wants to reside in you. We've preached to believe that this happened, but don't live with him. No, no, no. Believe that that's true and live with him on the inside of you. People need to hear that and they wanna hear that. Who would turn away? God wants to live on the inside of you. Nobody would turn that away if they clearly got clarity and somebody told them, just preach the gospel and let God change their lives. Notice Paul didn't convince them, or force them. It was God who changed them. So then they got baptized into the faith. The baptism for repentance wasn't even necessary anymore. They were baptized into Christ, into Christian faith. They'd receive salvation. Now look, let's look at this language here. Some commentators make mention that this text about baptism was not a formula. I gotta tell you, like, there's a whole split in the church world about this phrase right here, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Among Pentecostals in particular, and the divide is over a formula of baptism. So Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go in all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then Paul says here to people he's trying to preach to about salvation, not trying to like prove all theological truths forever. It says that they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And so some, some people wanna go, no, the formula is we baptize in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Okay, first of all, if Jesus said it and then Paul said it, who wins? There's that. Second of all, Paul's not trying to establish any formula. He's not saying, and from here forward, thou shalt be baptized in thy name of Jesus only if. Not his motive. Luke is, a core, is recording this just going, they got baptized into the faith of Jesus because they had been baptized into a baptism of acts and works and repentance. Now they're being baptized into the family of God. By the way, any of you that haven't been baptized as a Christian, today's your day. Let's go. We're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but you're being baptized into the faith of Jesus. The formula was not the focus. Faith in Jesus was the focus. They're saved. That's what commentators are saying here. The baptizing in the name of Jesus means they were saved. They got become a part of the family of God. And then, so the big picture is, they were saved, they were changed forever when they received clarity from the gospel and the desire of God to live on the inside of them. Now here's the close up reality, you ready for this? This is great, I love this part of the text. God gave these guys instant miraculous signs. 
He gave them proof of his love for them, proof of his power, when he gave them their whole lives. Paul laid hands on him, which is a language of prayer. It's about anointing, it's covering from someone else in the faith. It doesn't have to be an apostle. It's a seasoned Christian laying hands and praying on him. And it says the spirit of God came upon them and they received the Holy Spirit that now dwells in them. That's what he started teaching. He didn't ask them, have you received the Holy Ghost and gifts? He said, if you receive the Holy Spirit, they believed it. And then when Paul laid hands for them after their salvation to be filled with the Spirit, which all of you need or else you're not even saved, then God even gave them miraculous gifts. And I love this text for so many reasons. First of all, he lays hands to pray for them and they speak in new tongues or new languages. They're in Ephesus all of a sudden with an ability to speak in new tongues and new languages and prophesy, which is preaching. They have, a, they have a new message. They have a new thing to say. Jesus changed my life. It's no longer my repentance and behavior, but it's God coming into my life. And watch this. It's still something God can do. This is a decade or two after Acts chapter two. Now watch, this is what I love about how great our God is. How great is our God? He gave the same gifts to these novice, untrained baby Christians that he gave to the 120 in Acts 2 in the upper room who were the seasoned saints that walked with God. Bless God, they were around in the beginning when Jesus walked there. Hallelujah. He gave the same gifts to those seasoned saints that he gave to these novice new believers. You know why? Because God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't just do spiritual gifts for spiritual people. He gives gifts to people because he's good. He's a good God and every one of you should have a private personal prayer language with God. Every one of you can. You don't must, you can and you should, it's great for you. Man, we've let weirdos stop us from good theology and the same gifts that God gave here, he wants to give to you. God ultimately wants you to have the gift of prophecy which is going to work and telling people about Jesus, which is going to your office and going to your class and going to your barracks and going on parade field and saying, man, God is changing my life and that we carry the message of the prophets. The same thing God did for these 12 is what he gave to the 120 in the upper room. I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind. How great is our God? He's so kind. He doesn't just give spiritual things to spiritual people. He gives his spirit to rookie baby Christians at the same measure that he gave the seasoned saints. Are y'all seeing that? Man, can we just expect God to do godly things? Can we just believe God to do great things? Hey, I wanna encourage you today, by the way, let me just pause and say this. At the end of every service, we always have prayer teams at every location. And I wanna encourage you, if you would like to grow in your prayer life and your devotion to the gospel and sharing the gospel with other people, let me ask you this question. Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believe? Do you have a life devoted to the Holy Spirit? Does the Spirit of God lead and live in you? That's what the exchange of the gospel actually includes. Have you guys received the Holy Spirit? Have you just believed in this story of the gospel, but have you also believed the rest of the story that the Spirit of God wants to live in you, gift you and enable you to pray deeper prayers and even prophesy and share his gospel? Some of us are great prophets, things that don't matter. We love to evangelize sports stats and teams and politics, left and right. Fox News and CNN, we love to evangelize that stuff. But are you so full of the spirit that you become a prophet of the Lord? I'm encouraged by this. I hope you're not feeling me judge you. I'm not like calling any of you out. This is for all of us. Finally, let me just push you a little bit harder. (laughs) You're welcome, I love you. Remember the title of my sermon, the gospel changes people for real. I mean, is this life change or what? They got started speaking in tongues and preaching instantly. They, were, they got corrected in their bad theology. We, all of us have friends that just don't know enough of, the, of Jesus. All of us do, myself included. But God will change that. He'll change them and he'll change their lives. Now watch this. So stay focused on the gospel and its power to change people. Remember, the gospel changes people for real, so stay focused on it. And listen, let me just encourage you. Not everyone cares about what you care about. Not everyone's gonna care about this gospel. Remember Judas, rolling deep with Jesus, rejected him. Any of you guys have friends that aren't fans of what you're fans of? And you try and you're always wearing the gear and you're always talking about Tennessee. Come on, Jesus went to Tennessee. He's a volunteer. Argue with me, that's fine, I'm on the microphone. (laughs) Not everyone's a fan. Still can't, 
can't lose the passion for that. Watch what happens. So Paul preaches, they get saved, they get filled with the Spirit, they have these gifts. And then it says he entered, oh, so stay focused and don't waste time on people that don't care. Like love them, keep an open hand, but move on. Watch what happens. So he enters the synagogue for three months and he spoke boldly, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. First of all, let me just remind you, the book is called The Acts of the Apostles, The Behaviors, The Dedications of the Apostles. This is something Paul did. He went to church all the time. And I encourage you Christians, go to church. Be, you guys are here. Those of you watching, go to church. Be regular in church. Man, I get it. Take a vacation, travel with your family, whatever, but don't just sleep in and opt out because you think, hey, we got it online now. Hey, that's the same thing. It's not the same. Get to church, speak boldly. Look at what it says, he was reasonable. He was reasoning with people. Hey, I get it, here's where I'm at, here's where you're at, here's what I believe, here's what God's done to me. He's just reasoning with people. He's not arguing, cramming it down their throat. He's not judging anybody. And look what it says, he's persuading them about the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Paul. Well, this is my denominational beliefs. This is how I do it, so this is how you have to do it. He's reasoning and persuading people to Jesus. If you'll keep Jesus at the center of what you're trying to tell people about, man, Jesus will scoop them up, grab them up, change them up. You just keep pushing people to Jesus. I don't have answers to everything. I do know Jesus does. And then it says this, but some became stubborn and continued in their unbelief. Anybody got kids? Right? That came real quick, dad. Some became stubborn and continued in their unbelief. And that's gonna happen. There will be people that just don't care, don't want what you want, don't want what you have. God wants them more than you want them, so just hand them to the Lord. Keep an open heart and an open hand. They're even speaking evil of the way. This is one of the first names of the church in the New Testament, the way, before the congregation. So what did he do? He withdrew from them. He just like, okay, you guys don't want this, no problem. He withdrew from them, he took his disciples and now started reasoning daily, not in the synagogue, but in the hall of Tyrannus, which is like a Greek lecture hall of the day. And this he continued for two years, watch this, so that all the residents of Asia, what an amazing statement. All the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now listen, notice it didn't say, so all the residents of Asia converted to Jesus, but they all heard it. This group was so passionate about evangelism, about sharing this gospel. Can you imagine that everyone in Clarksville has heard the gospel of Jesus. Everyone at Austin P has heard the gospel because man, we didn't stop talking about it. Just stay focused on being a witness to this gospel. Stay focused on telling people about Jesus and you let God handle their reactions. Remember, it was God who saved them, God who changed them, not Paul. He's just the messenger. He brought clarity, he brought passion. I wanna encourage you to keep your passion hot for, God, hot for the Lord, hot for his gospel. Stay stirred up for what God's doing in your church, in your city, keep growing and telling people about Jesus. But if, if no one listens to you, if no one follows the Lord you follow, keep sharing it. That's not your problem. As long as I've been a leader, I've been coached by other pastors, I've helped other pastors, I've taught this to our staff. One statement I've heard over and over again, you cannot coach passion. That's something God has to put into people. Some people just won't care. That's not your problem. Pray for them, love them, keep an open hand. You're welcome to hear this anytime. Be a friend and be kind, but don't get stuck or delayed telling the next person because somebody got stubborn and antagonistic. I love that Paul just was like, you know what, fine. I'll just move on. They got stubborn, unbelief. They were speaking evil, so he left. He's like, okay, no problem. Jesus said it like this when he sent them out. He goes, if they don't listen to you, just shake the dust off and keep telling others. No matter what, stay focused on growing passion for Jesus, telling others about the Lord, bring clarity in small groups and bold conversations, trust God to change lives and do something amazing. Write these four thoughts down and I'm not gonna explain them, I'm just gonna say them and close. As I close this message out, I wanna challenge you, do whatever you can to reignite the flames of passion in your life for Jesus and his gospel. Whatever you did at first, get back to doing those again. If you've never done it before, start praying regularly, read your Bible, go to church, be in small group, serve other people, show up and grow up the flames of passion for God. Number two, ask the Lord, who can I tell about Jesus this week? And start to pray for them right now. 
Pray for opportunity to tell some one person. You don't have to tell everybody. Tell somebody about Jesus. Third, believe God to show up in miraculous ways. You might share the gospel and the person you pray for starts speaking in tongues right in front of you and you've never even done that. You know, brain surgeons never do brain surgery on themselves. God may do something in someone else that he's not done in you yet. Pray and believe God to bring a healing miracle or some kind of transformation in them and believe God to do something great. And fourth, refuse to get discouraged. Stay focused on telling people about Jesus. Come on, amen, everybody. Come on, let's pray to the Lord. Father, we love you and we've heard your word. We thank you that your word is good and alive and powerful. And before anybody moves, can I just ask you to pray with me? Can we open our hands to the Lord and just say to God, Lord, I'm ready to reignite passion for you again. I want more of your spirit on the inside of me. I commit to reignite the flames of passion for Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come alive in me like never before. Lord, would you transform me internally, externally. May the passion of Jesus be white hot in me. Everybody pray this prayer and mean it. Say, God, I believe in Jesus, that he died for me. I will live the rest of my life on passionate fire for Jesus Christ. Say, God, I'm all in. I'm all yours to the glory of God. Now say this and mean it, church. Come on, say, God, use me however you want in Jesus' name. Amen, everybody.